All right. Good morning, folks. As I see people joining in here, I'm going to go ahead and get everything kicked off. Hopefully you see my screen with a big slide that says daily lunch and learn. But happy Monday to you all. Just wanted to uh, say a quick welcome, introduce myself, and then we will go ahead and dive right into any questions you may have. So, uh, yeah. Oh, let me make sure we are recording. Wonderful. I want to make sure it was actually doing that, and I will get started here. So, welcome. This is our decision daily lunch and learn. Uh, and this is something that we host as a company every Monday through Thursday. And it's really just a time for you to sit and ask questions of our decisions experts over here in the company. Um, so it's really just kind of an open forum Q&A. You can ask us anything you want about the product, how to do something inside the product, about future features coming up, about issues you may be having, about the company itself and where we're growing. Really feel free. This is uh, meant to be just uh, an open and honest time for us to sit and discuss and talk to you guys. Uh, with that being said, if there's a question we can't answer or I myself can't answer, it's uh, something I'm more than happy to get the right people and follow up with you in the future if that's something we want to do. So the way we do this is we have a chat panel and a Q&A panel, as well as your, your kind of panelist panel, I guess, or participant panel. And if you want to ask a question, you can feel free to type it up. There were a few that were submitted ahead of time that I'll start with. Uh, or I see as someone's already doing, you can actually use the raise hand option on your on the participant panel, and then I can let you unmute and you can actually ask the question verbally and we can discuss it that way. Uh, and so yeah, just so you know, we do this every Monday through Thursday from noon to one Eastern. We record them and post them on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you miss one or want to see a previous one, you can check them out that way. But it's just a, it's a time that we're available to connect. So to introduce myself, if I haven't met you, I, I recognize a number of names here, uh, but my name is Eric Walmerink. I've been with Decisions for about eight years now and have kind of a, a jack of all trades here at Decisions. I've done a little bit of everything. I've uh, I started originally as a junior developer writing some code. Um, I've actually kind of moved around from support to professional services, doing big projects and small projects. I did our IT security compliance for a while. And most recently was in charge of the training team and training initiatives, uh, kind of traveling around the world and training our customers on the best uses and uh, ways to, to use decisions. Currently, my role is around product management. So I sit and get to talk to all of our customers and partners and, and with our engineering team and plan out what decisions is going to be adding to the tool over the next 18 months and, and years to come. So that's kind of my current role, something I'm very passionate about. I care a lot about what we're doing to improve and fix uh, the experience and use of decisions. So uh, if, if there's not a ton of questions today, I can dive into some of that as well. If you have questions around the roadmap, uh, I'm a good resource to ask those questions too. And so without, without further ado, uh, I'm going to dive right in. I saw the, uh, there's a pre-submitted question I'll get to first, and then I'll go to the first raised hand, and we'll just uh, kind of bounce around as you guys have questions and ask or and answer any questions that you may have. So let me dive in. First question came in. Uh, it says, hello, is there a way I can allow every user to have a view action on a dashboard so that way they, everyone can see a process view? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to just dive into decisions and talk a little bit about how we do permissioning and, and actions and those sorts of things. And hopefully this will answer, answer the question. So we're talking about process views. So I'm going to very quickly create a process uh, folder. So we're going to start with some data here. I'm going to create a flow execution extension. Maybe we'll call this time off request. If you've attended training, you're very familiar with the time off request uh, data structure. Um, we'll have like a start date which is a date time. We'll have an end date, which is also a date time. And then we'll have maybe a reason. Why do you need time off? And obviously, if this were a real process, this would be much more, uh, much more robust. Then we're gonna have a flow that creates time off request. And all I'm doing this for is to get to where I can save some data and present it on a dashboard. So we're doing this very quickly. Uh, I have my, oh, sorry, I have the step that I actually want is called setup process folder. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, uh, what this is is the ability to create a tracking folder. Uh, we'll just put it in our current folder for now. That will track all the execution statistics and data about an executing process. So you can store things about the data of the process. You have a whole series of flow steps to update like the state or the, uh, the percent complete of your process. And then all the data gets uh, uh, documents and all sorts of things. And all that data gets shoved into a tracking or a process folder that you can then report on. And in our case, put on a dashboard so that people can view the details of. 
Uh, so let me just do this really quick. I'm gonna put my initials here because I can, or maybe we'll do uh, TOR, timeout request. Uh, we could give a description. This is a description. We gotta tell it what data type to use, which is I forgot up here, use my special data structure. Uh, let's just put some constant data for now. Normally you'd fill this in with uh, like data from your process, but let's say I wanna take just this Friday off and the reason is, um, I don't know, I want a three-day weekend. Try to stop me. All right, be a little combative in my request, I guess. And then we'll create some sort of folder name, you know, like Eric Walmering process or time off request. Request for Friday. Obviously this might be dynamically generated from flow data. Um, we can dive into some of that process as well. But all I really wanna do is run this once to get to run it, I see my, my tracking folder get created here, TUR, Eric Warmering time off request, and I could click into here and view details about this, this request. This is the process view. I can see all the states, who's interacted with it. If there's tasks, they would show up here. I can add additional comments or documents or, or attachments over here as well. And I can also see any sort of uh, additional things that have been added to this folder. So the question now, and how can we allow everyone to either left click and view or have an action that views it or right click and view it as well. And you have a couple of options here. So I'm going to create a very simple dashboard to start out. And it's just going to be a simple page. Uh, maybe we have a button that kicks off a dashboard or a process or a time off request, but I'm going to grab a re report viewer. We're going to create a really simple report. Simple time off request report. Add our data structure as the thing we report on. Add a couple fields of the structure, like uh, the reason, maybe the created by who, who's actually running this request, and the start date and end date. It'll be down here at the bottom. Uh, start date and end date should be up here. And so I say end. Oh, I said end time or end. Oh, end date. End time is um also tracking stuff. So anyway, I create a report, I see the reason, I see who created it, I can go ahead and go see it. So how, if I have this page, here it is, let's go ahead and save that. Let's put it on a folder here. And I'm doing a lot of things really quickly just to get to the question. So if, if you're confused on some of the things I've been working on or done on my screen very quickly, um, I, I'm happy to dive into more detail here, but here we go. I get to here, I have my report, I have a dashboard and I have my request here. So how do I control who can left click the first line and get into the process folder, as well as any right click actions on here so that they can make sure that the right people see it. So first and foremost, the permission you have to care about is where this folder lives. So if this folder lives somewhere in decisions, anyone who's going to view the process data, process data rather, must have can view permissions for where this folder lives. So in our case, if I want to be able to view Eric Walmart's time off request, I must have view permissions on its parent folder. And so that's something you can right click and say manage, manage permissions. And I can add either at the account level or the group level permissions for a group, let's just say everyone can view the data inside this folder. Uh, maybe they can open it, maybe they can't, or maybe it can't open. Sorry, I think I'm backwards here. Can view means it shows up in the portal. Apologies. Can open means that if they click a report item, it will actually open up. Uh, can use means that there's some other actions they can have. This is more for like a flow. They can, they can actually use a flow in their other process. So you got to make sure can open permissions is set first. And so once you have that permission and you've given access oh, back up here, you give an access to this page for someone to see. Now it's just controlling which actions they see, either on right click or on left click here uh, that you do it. And so there's two ways to control this. You can control this on the report level where you can go to this report itself and say, hey, here's the limited set of actions for this report on this page that everyone can see regardless of permissions level. So you can filter it that way. Or you can filter it on a structure level. And you can say, I either want to create actions or have limited actions for specific people globally across the entire portal. And so if it's the first, you wanna control it on the page itself. Well, we're just gonna go edit our page. We're gonna click the report. 
And under here, I believe under behavior, yep, here we go. You can filter out which actions are shown either by the category of actions or by the names of those actions themselves. So I can say, these are the only actions I wanna show for this report on this page. And it's kind of a, a very custom set of permissions uh, or cut set of action lists based on those parameters. The other way to control those actions is globally. And if you now have the structure here, like my time off request structure, you'll see here that I can generate or create user actions or you know grouped items actions, or uh, I could go ahead and create an action visibility rule, which means that I can set up a statement rule that says uh, this user or this group that you can see it's the statement rule editor. Uh, this user, this group, based on this set of data, can take these actions. So here it's saying return true to filter out or remove the action. So maybe I don't want you to edit. So I'll say if the action um, name equals or is edit, and you're Eric, so we add a new rule step, and we say that the initiating uh, user email, I guess I'm admin, so I can do this and say is admin. And then this is all in our documentation site. So um, if you want to know a little bit more about the, the intricacies or complexities of this, you can go check that out. Uh, but I can write this global action rule that says if the action is edit and any new student user email is adminsdecisions.com, filter out or remove those actions. And that applies globally anywhere in the portal and is logged in and trying to look at this data, they'll never be able to right click and edit. Now, I don't think I had an edit action to begin with, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. And so that's how you'd start to consider uh, the dashboard. So the first and foremost, you have to make sure to view process data that the person can open and view the folder that the process data lives in. And then it's just controlling the action. You wanna do that on a report. You wanna do that on a page or dashboard. What's the best way you wanna approach that? Um, Hopefully, I saw the hand raise and come down. I think Manal was the one who actually originally asked that. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, if you want me to dive deeper on any of that, please feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat and I will dive deeper. But that's how you would consider that. All right. So the next one who raised their hand, uh, I believe was Radley. I think you beat Neil. So let me go ahead and say allow to talk. That should give you the option to unmute and you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, you're. Um, so actually I have two questions. One I, I think is pretty straightforward. Um, I have a, a rather long form that I'm presenting to an approver in a workflow. So someone's already mm -hmm. filled out like 90% of this thing, the approver gets it. They're taken to the first uh, field or object that they can act on, which is the very bottom of the form. So we're getting mm -hmm. some feedback that users are a little bit confused out of the gate that they need to scroll up, read stuff, and then back down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a way to force the form to start at the top I didn't realize it, it might be tab order. Hmm. Yeah, and it is, but everything except the two two things the approver can act on, I've said is read only. So I, the first oh. thought was to put the very first field in as the first tab order. I'm guessing because it's disabled, it really doesn't care that it has a tab order. Um, gotcha. Okay, okay. Let's let me try to recreate this very quickly. Uh, let's do. Let me do a new folder. We'll call it long form. I think I understand the issue. So let me let me work through it uh, sure. with you. So we're gonna create a form. Sorry, I don't name things well. Apologies. We're gonna make it really, really tall. Okay, well, I'm gonna try to make it really tall, somewhat tall. We have a button at the bottom. Uh, I'm gonna move one of these rows down for the sake of testing. Okay, so the bottom, we have the thing that they want to fill out, like your name. Oh, I want that actually over here. And then at the top, we have some disabled things. So we'd have yeah. like, you know, a text box that is uh, some text. Uh, shift control enter, that does left. Okay, and it's disabled, you said, right? Yes. So if you say behavior initially enabled, cool. So it's scrolling to the bottom instead of starting at the top and forcing these to scroll. Okay, and you have the tab editor where I guess button would be third, some text would be first, and your button would be second, right? Yep, one, two, three. All right, let's try that, let's see what that looks like. Uh, what I should do, okay, I think this might work. I might have to make the flow that calls this, call the form small, but that's okay. 
you can do that from the flow, by the way, just in case anyone cares. Uh, you can set the form size from here. All right, so we have text in this one, ASTF, we have text in this one, some other text. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that while I'm here. Actually, how do I do? Is that not here anymore? Uh oh. Uh, phone setup. There we go. And we can set the size here somewhere. Sizing. Okay. In its own window, we're going to set my own size uh, with a small height. Uh, All right. I think this will work. We say go, we run. Ah, oh, okay. It didn't respect my form size. It's making my form too big. I need my form to be smaller. Let's try this again. Form. Oh, dialogue. Okay, sizing. Hmm. Should have respected my size. Let's try this one here. I may have found a quick bug. Be fun. Okay. I don't think it's a sub dialogue is the only thing. Okay. Also might not work because I'm running it in the debugger. The debugger sometimes. There we go. Okay, okay. Ah, so it did. It jumped all the way to the bottom, and we'd want it to be at the top and force them to scroll down. Cool. I think that's by design. I think that's intentional, right? It makes sense. Like, yep. It makes that's sense. The first, first yeah. field they could fill out. I get it. So how would I turn that off, or how would I, how would I change that? Okay, okay. Something we could do. Maybe this is it. Auto focus first control. I don't know. Let's set it. If not, uh, what my thought was as a work run, I think this is something I could. Ah, thought, okay. Well, there's the setting that changes that. Um, looks like we've already thought of that. I was going to approach the product team and see uh, what we do there. So it looks like there is this uh, setting here called, what do I call it? Auto focus first control. And that looks like it takes the tabbing order, finds the first initialized control and then focuses to that first. And if you turn that off, it looks like it just starts at the top of the form. And you're on that that some text object right now, right? Or are you on the uh, generic form up? So I just click the, okay. the kind of surface area of the form and scroll down and it's under tabbing. Cool. Excellent. There's also this, uh, this is relatively new if you haven't seen this, restrict tabbing to form is um, also for like some ADA compliance stuff we're working on so that you can tab between sections and forms and those sorts of things. Okay. Anyway, Great. Great. a little different. Cool. And then you can do the second question. Yeah, if that's okay. Let's do it. Um, I have uh, some repeaters on my form and I'm taking the output of those repeaters and through an end velocity merge, writing them to HTML and then to a PDF. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of instances, not every instance, but a couple instances where as I'm going through the for each loop, to write each of the repeaters into the HTML, um, that the, the order of the items in the repeater is being reversed from what it is on the form. So hmm. it's coming out in backwards order in, in the PDF at the, the end of that flow. Interesting. Um, like I said, it's not every time. And I talked, I think, with Will about this last week, because we'd only seen it once at that point. Mm -hmm. um, we've done some more testing, and uh, we're in our production environment. We're just kind of doing a, a soft launch. And we have another instance of this now. So I didn't know what, what options I, I have to, in, to force that ordering. Because it doesn't look like there's any sort of, the index doesn't stay on the repeater. It's only mm -hmm. when you're you know, interacting with the repeater. So I didn't know what other ways that I could force the, the ordering. Yeah. Um... Are people, so people are interacting with it. They're adding and removing rows and doing stuff like yep. that, I'm assuming. Yes. I'm guessing there's like there's like there, there's a repeatable scenario here. Do you know the repeatable scenario? It's like it's always when someone adds a row in the I, middle of the repeater or I, I don't. I haven't been able to recreate it. Got it. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's um interesting. Is, is there a way to add a repeater item somewhere other than the end? I mean you can move them. You can move them up and down. Okay, and I've not given users that functionality. Okay, um, they can add it to the end or delete any one of them they've added, but they can't. Okay. they can't move them around. I'm guessing there's some like there's some series of things like if they add two and remove okay. one, or only remove one first and then add one, like it's something like that. Okay. Um, 
so we as a as decisions we as decisions need to recreate that and figure that out yeah that that's not expected um can you restart the list after the um after the the form exit um in in one of the repeaters that'd be easy it's, okay. it's a travel request so it's the flights that they're taking so i can just i can just sort it on departure date like that one's easy the mm -hmm. other one is a list of travelers of people taking the trip i have no way to know what order uh what order they were at in. okay so we do need to solve that yeah because I mean, you could for temporarily, you could throw a sort array step or a collection sort step or rule collection sort step and order your items specifically. But I think I think the bigger issue there is this does sound like a product bug and something we could have. Do you already have a, a ticket open for this? I, I don't. Um, okay. I just I just found out about it earlier today and it was the second cool. one. I, I didn't pursue it really hard after the first one, but now we got yeah, another yeah. one, so it's it's gonna keep happening. <laughs> Well, yeah, a one-off is potentially, you know, no big deal, but when right. twice, twice as repeatable. Okay, yep. uh, let me take some notes here. Um, repeater is is it oh is it one hundred percent reverse? Yes. Yep. It's not. It's never put in like a random order. It's always. It's not reverse, right? It's completely reversed. Yep. Oh. Okay. Yeah. There's no so like. Initially, there's no setting or anything here on a, oh, that's the wrong form. There's no setting on a form that's like inverse output or something like that for a repeater. Um, okay. So I think what we got to do here is I'll take this to the support team and okay. see if there's any, like if anyone's seen this before or has heard about it. Um, awesome. They'll, they'll, what they'll probably wind up doing is creating a ticket for you. Okay. And then re reaching out to see if we can get uh, your use case a little bit more dialed in, and then we'll try to repeat it. But yeah, that's definitely a product bug. We'll get that fixed right away. That sounds great, Eric. Thank you so much. Hey, you bet, sir. Well, bummer. I'm, I'm, what am I? I'm two for three. I couldn't get that one. All right. Uh, cool. Two for three is not bad. I'm usually like 50% on these calls, so I'll take 50% for now. Um, Let's go ahead and dive into the next one. Maybe I'll maybe I'll miss this one. Uh, but we got one a text. Uh, of course, someone someone typed into the Q and A panel. Let's see if I can answer this. Uh, trying to get a file upload to work. I licked the lab, but it's unclear to me how the file is actually uploaded and where it goes so you can act upon it. So if we wanted to, how do we send the file to another location, such as an S three uh, S three location, rather than the decisions file system? Wonderful. Yeah. Let's clear up some confusion around files because they are for sure uh, potentially very confusing. So, uh, how do you get file upload to work? Let's create a form. I'm going to use a simple form this time because I really like how simple forms look. Uh, we're going to call this file upload. We're going to throw a big button at the bottom and a file upload control on the top. I want that above. There we go. Uh, do I want this to look like a file control? I want it to look maybe like a link. Sure. We'll do it like that. And our button will be called. Upload. All right. There's a couple things that happen with file uploads. Uh, oh, I see you raised your hand, Neil. Since you typed it in, I'm going to allow you to talk so you can interrupt me if I'm if I'm misunderstanding this correctly. But uh, I'll just uh, go for it. Oh, go ahead. Nope, you're doing great. Um, for, yeah, if anything you can do to walk through this, this will be great. Cool. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah. So file upload control on decisions does a couple of different things. Uh, you know, aside from the the settings here, we'll just call this my file for now. And the way it looks, the way the label is, the way it extends, or the way it behaves. The one thing you care about, as far as understanding the data that comes in, is right here under output type. There's three types of ways that we can consume the data from a file. The first is file data. This is a decisions defined structure that contains the data of the file, as well as like the file name and some metadata about it, like the data was modified, the, the, the count of the size of it, et cetera. Uh, but this then becomes flow data. So it exists only in the decisions workflow for the, until you do something with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. The next is byte array, which it just consumes it as the, the, the pure data of whatever thing you've uploaded. So if it's a PNG, we don't carry the label, we don't carry the name of it, we just carry the actual data that's contained inside of that, that file. It's a file stream that comes in as a byte array. Uh, so then you can do whatever you want with it, kind of like file data, except we, we, there's no structure around it. It's just an array of bytes. You then go shove into a database or do whatever you want with them. 
The third is a file reference, which is a little different because it will do similar to file data, except instead of actually uploading it into your workflow cache, it will actually upload it to the file system that Decisions is on and then create a reference for that for your workflows. So if you have really, really big files that you're then going to manipulate and use later in the workflow, or you're just uploading them for like storage and retention or like archival, file reference is great because it keeps your workflow executions lighter because there's less data actually running through the workflow process. The whole byte array is not actually workflow data now getting handed from one step to another. It's just a reference to what's now stored on the file system. And if you need to use it, it will pull it back from the file system. So that's the, this is kind of the first uh, consideration is how do I want the data to be organized once it comes in and then and then figure out what to do with it. So I'm, I'm going to pick file data because I think it's the one most people wind up using. You can choose a max file size so that people aren't overloading your system. You can specify specific extensions so that you know people can't upload harmful things uh, like you know rare rare files or executables and those sorts of things. Uh, but you have some control over how the data comes in. Um, so on and so forth. So let's just say we sort of file data, it comes in, uh, and then we go from here. So now to yeah, kind of, wait. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Pause. So, so once you've done that now, if a user execute, like if you debug this or something right now, where, where would that, and you, if you selected a file on your disk and you hit upload, where, what would, what is actually happening there? Is it actually going into the decision server at that point? Not yet. So what okay. it, it kind of it does. So if I have a flow and I say upload the file and I can grab my form that I just created where you go form and we pick my existing form here. Uh, there it is. Cool. And I just end it. So if I run this and debug and say debug, I select my file. Uh, let's see if I do I have a safe file I could pick here. Uh, I don't know what picture this is, but it's of me. So that's always safe to upload. Um, and I say upload. So now what happens is it took the data, since I chose file data, it actually gave me the file name, the length, the file type, an ID for it, and the byte array, which I don't see in the debugger because it would be meaningless data. And it's now in cache. So as soon as it leaves this step, it's in workflow memory. It's in cache okay. memory, but it's, it's not on the file system and it's not stored anywhere. The moment I hit the end step, my cache is cleared for the flow, so I, that file is now gone. So it never actually gets uploaded to the file system unless I had chosen file reference, in which case you then could go find it on your actual decision file system. Okay. So depending on which one you chose there, file data or byte array, as soon as I hit the red end step, would get blown away from my cache. File reference uh, would actually still be on the file system, and the reference kind of ID, unless I saved it, would be lost here. So now that you now that you have file data, like I have coming out of this step something called my file, I have the bytes, the, the the byte array, the contents of my file, the name, the type, the ID, the length, and any tags that I've applied to it. And so now you can do stuff with your data. Um, specifically for S3, I don't know if we have any S3 steps where you have to add the module for it. Nope, oh, that's something deep in my ear. Sorry. Uh, but we do have some file directory steps. So if I go to like file management here you'll see that I can uh, create directories, I can move files from one directory to another. In our case, I could uh, upload my file to the directory um, because it's here and then I could move it somewhere else. So now I have some steps here to either put it onto a file share, or put it onto some network. Um, yeah, I have some network steps here to, to read and, and push files. I can compress them and zip them up and move it. Uh, if I'm using something like a Dropbox integration, um, I could I could take the file data and put it into one of the Dropbox steps, but you as the workflow designer uh, essentially have either the byte array or the file data to work with. Um, now, if you're just using it in decisions and you're like saying tying this to a process folder, like I want to take the, the uploaded file and say add it. Oh, where's add file? Oh, I'm in the I'm in the data explorer. Hold on. There should be an add file step which adds it to or add file reference to folder. That's what I care about. I can take that reference that's uploaded and tie it to a decisions folder. And then that shows up as something you can click in the folder tree and open and view. And that reference is stored on the decisions database or on the decisions file system. So you have, you have some choices here. You could then you have database integration steps. So you can shove it into a database. 
Um, if you have a data structure that uses the file data type, it will put it in the database rather than the file system. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of options here, I guess. Let me pause and see uh, what what you're doing with the file and what questions you may have. Yeah, in this case, it's probably just going to be like a CSV file, like upload a bunch of records that then we can start parsing through, you know, and using in the workflow. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So most likely, then you're choosing you're choosing file data or or uh, what the other one was a byte array, and then you would have your you know for each Excel or CSV step. Where is, where is it? Uh, isn't there a for each Excel? Oh, import Excel or CSV or for each Excel. Yeah, so you can loop through the Excel or CSV one at a time. You can import it and map it to a data type. Um, I mean, you have some choices here, but really, what this step, the next step would take in is file data. So you could just map in everything that's uploaded, which is my whole file, and now I'm using that here and converting it to a type or grabbing the columns or mapping that to whatever. Um, you know, you have all of the Excel and CSV manipulation steps over here. Okay, great. Yep, this clears it up. I'll give cool. It yeah, and some uh, someone in the comments mentioned that the S3 steps, ah, they're part of the AWS module. That actually makes a ton of sense. So if you do want to store it in like a, a you know, a S3 specifically, you would come here to System Administration Features and you would add the AWS module. Sure. And then that should give you all the steps there to, to manipulate files. Mm -hmm. um, and another comment came in that's actually, this actually is a little important. Um, thank you for the clarification. Uh, when you do file data, not file reference, because file reference will get stored uh, categorically better, but file data, it actually does get stored in a temp folder that gets cleared. Uh, oh, I guess I can't show that because I'm only sharing my screen. But in the decisions install uh, folder structure, there is under file storage a temp folder that file data does get pushed to. So in case your flow like crashes and you need to restart it, we can pull that file back in. Uh, but that does get cleared uh, over time. So that's not a long-term storage option. That's a good kind of technical clarification there too. So cool. Does that help answer your question? Yes. I don't know why I removed that. Cool. Yes, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Let me go ahead and click save. Let me say I answered that. Thank you, anonymous person who helped clarify some of my test stuff. And cool. All right. I don't see any open questions unless I missed one and no raised hands. So I'll pause for a moment here. Oh, ah, there we go. Uh, oh, Randy, you joined twice. I think I have to allow your second user to talk. There we go. You should be able to unmute now. Uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, sorry, I um, had deleted the link for my calendar, so Radley was kind enough to send me <laughs> a link right quick. Um, no yeah, I had a um, problem over the weekend. We have a, a flow that um, has four different approvers, so it kind of goes through approver one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Hold on a second. I got another person talking that's probably in the background. No, that's all right. Um, I can still hear you. And uh, so essentially my essentially my question is um, when we map data from the workflow to extension data, mm -hmm. you know, in a for the in the process folder. Does that data get immediately um, saved to our database that the extension data is related to? Or is there, is there a time difference or like a lazy, lazy write or something like that? Because um, we were, we had data that was mapping to the extension data and it was not being persisted to the the data structure related to extension data. Um, we reset the service on Friday afternoon, and this morning I'm not able to duplicate it. It is now writing to extension data every time. Hmm. But uh, we had about four workflows that happened over the weekend that did not get written um, to the database. Gotcha. Um, I don't know why. Interesting. 
Yeah, that, that's 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 a great question. Uh, something I'd want to look at your how the process is built in more detail to to really understand what potentially happened there. But here's here's some of the high level concepts. Is that when I like I have here I have a process folder and I set up extension and it saves off whatever I call time off request is my extension data right. The moment I hit this step, it calls the database and it saves off this extension data. Uh, so as the data exists here. So if I go a hundred steps later and then end the flow, what's saved in the database most likely is this. Now we've done a ton of work here, uh, and there is a setting somewhere. Oh, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Maybe we moved it somewhere else. Um, maybe it's on the actual process data itself that will try okay. to recognize if the data has been updated. So if this structure here, this extension data that comes out of this step gets modified or changed, it will recognize that as a change event and update the database if you've turned that setting on. If you haven't, and say approver number three changes one of the fields on there, and you have it set it properly back onto what this outputs, which is that extension data, then it won't necessarily save it back to the database. You have this original save data instead of the updated data. So a couple ways to combat that is to ensure that all the outputs of your process that do want to modify the data go into this extension data output from your setup process right. folder step. So and then what I would also recommend that, adding that, um, is here so under nice is flow management. Progress checks, nope, it's those under, are like, those oh, come on, where are you? Graded, but they're not great. Where's like, all my stuff? You're great, you're great. Sorry. Do. You're great. Yeah, hold on a second. Process, oh, no problem. No, I got there we go. Like, too many people talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I, I work at busy office. I'm, 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 I'm gonna. You're fine. You're fine. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is this save process data step. Uh, you'll see that there's no inputs and no outputs, but this ensures what it does is it checks the database and checks the extension data coming out of here, and make sure that if any changes have been made, it gets committed to the database at that moment. That way you're not relying on cash or, or the mapping of people to ensure that it's correct. So I would say at moments that you expect the data to change or that it potentially changes, go ahead and add this step in, uh, save process data. It's under process, which makes sense, the category process. And that should ensure that the database data is persisted. Now, if you have that step and the data wasn't updated still, again, that's something that, um, uh, go ahead and submit a support ticket and we'll just, we'll kind of dive in deeper and see what potentially may have happened there. Maybe there's a, a mapping issue or a, a, the way the flow restarts issue that we need to look at a little bit more closely. But this step is, is a really helpful step to ensure that your commits are uh, working the way you expect. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I was mapping the flow data directly to extension data after every okay. uh, state, you know, it's set state. Um, <clears throat> and again, it was, it had been working um, to, what I did temporarily on Saturday, because I was getting some user tickets, was to do a uh, select a selective update um, right after those approvals, and added that to the flow, and that seemed to fix it. Um, but you know, now today I'm thinking, well, I shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you should. You um, absolutely shouldn't have to do that. You're correct. So the save process data. Uh, probably will essentially do something similar. And, um, and you, you don't remember where that setting is that you're, or what it's called? No, I might have to go, I might have to go double check it. I'm, I can't remember if it's in, let me just look really quick. If it's in the actual data structure itself, you define this, or if it's in the actual system settings, I would have to go, no, ah, no, that's not it. Is that it? Let me, let me do some digging. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but I know it's somewhere. <laughs> All right, I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Uh, think, yeah, you bet. Figure out. And, hey, Eric, this, this is, this is actually Radley speaking now. If you go ahead oh. and send me, if you send me that, I'll get that over to, to Noel, who was, who was just talking. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, no right. problem. Thanks. Yeah, I'll send it to both of you or to, to you. That's no, not audit changes. Audit changes is other things. Yeah. I got to go figure out where that data or that setting is. I thought it was on the actual flow. I thought it was here, but I must be wrong. Is it, ah, is this it? 
This might be it. Might be something else. All right, let me just go clarify so I'm not giving you guys bad information. I don't want to. I don't want to be lying to you. So I'll go confirm. It might be this. Might be the other one. Okay, and I do have that checkbox checked on my set process ah. initial set process folder checked. So. Mm, okay. Okay. Yep. Let me let me dig in and make sure that's the right one then, because then the, there might be something else going on we want to look at uh, closer. All right, I got another hand raised. I think I'm gonna lower your hand, one of one of the Radleys. <laughs> um, if, if, if that's incorrect, you go ahead and raise your hand, but let's let Manal, oh, you re-raised it. Okay, let me let me let Manal here allow to talk. Uh, go ahead, Manal, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it. Can you hear me? I can. Awesome, I had that same question. So I'm, I did the same, um, like I put in the changes where manage permissions, they can do view, open, and can use. Mm -hmm. um, the weird thing is that on some requests, I can see the view option, and on some requests, I cannot see, and they're all pretty much the same request. Do you know why is you you, uh, you can't see which option? Sorry, oh, the view? I can't, yes, the view where I can see all the process view and everything. Hmm. I do have like an available, like the action, like the user action, but that is just checking for if the state is draft. It doesn't have anything else with it. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's really weird because on some of them, when I click left, it shows view, but on, yeah. on some of them, it just doesn't show it. Interesting. Um. Are they all stored in the same location? Like, are all of your process fold like, requests actually stored in the same file? Um, yes, they're all like the part of the same process folder. Interesting. OK. But now it's like showing me again. What? This is weird. Like, sometimes it shows the view, sometimes it doesn't. Huh. That is really weird. On the same report for the same user? Mm -hmm. Yes, on the same oh, That's report. really weird. That's really weird. Um, do you have any other crazy like action visibility rules going on that would potentially hide and show actions? Um, the only one that I have is the status draft, and that just checks that if the use if the action is draft, then doesn't show it. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, the only thing I could think is on my main flow. It's like I have a lot of process folders, but they're all like connected the same same thing hmm. uh, the only thing i can think of quickly is that sometimes i've seen if the, the process folder itself gets in a weird state like if this if i'm running this process and it's it fails or like the, the step actually throws an exception that potentially mm -hmm. then like some of the permissions around it and getting into it would be really really difficult uh, let's, hmm. Because I do have the other four other actions, which is like user action for admin delete, delete draft, download, and view workflow history. Hmm. Just, I just don't yeah, know. That, mm -hmm. That's super weird. Here, what we should do, and again, uh, probably let's go, go, go ahead and, and send a quick uh, note to supportaddecisions.com. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it and make sure someone hops on today because that's that's. That sounds like a sounds per, like permissioning, but it, it's very odd that it would work for some and excuse me, not others. So mm -hmm. we just need to look at it. Yeah, bummer. Sorry. No problem. I'll, I'll just submit a ticket. Thank you so much. Yeah, please do. And I'll keep an eye out for it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right. Another question came in. Does CloudWatch logging work only with AWS container installation? Um, I don't believe so. Let me confirm. I'll I'll ask the core dev team, but I'm pretty sure you can you can use the cloud logging services on any type of install. Um, and just so other people are aware, we've added uh, the CloudWatch, whatever Azure's version of it is. Um, I can't think of the name of it off the top. I have slides. Hold on, I can tell you in a minute. It's on my slides. Uh, what's the other one? I am blanking. Azure Analytics, sorry. Gosh, that's an easy one too. Uh, but yeah, we've added cloud logging for Amazon CloudWatch, Azure Analytics, and then we also can send out all of our logs in just STD out format because a lot of 
other kind of third party logging monitoring systems use that format. Um, and yeah, you should be able to, I'm, I'm about 95% certain that you should be able to use that on any type of install to send your logs to the cloud logging service rather than locally. Uh, but let me confirm that. Uh, if you don't mind, shoot me a quick note or email either in the chat or in just email eric at decisions.com. I'll confirm that. Um, but I'm going to say I'm mostly confident it does. Work with, let me take a quick note here so I can follow up. I'm going to say most likely yes. Good question, though. Oh, good. All right. Well, I think I'm below 50% today. I feel really bad. <laughs> but at least some of these I'll follow up on and then I'll, I'll be able to push it over 50%. Cool. All right. What other questions? We've got about 10 minutes left. Any other questions from folks on the call? I don't see any in the chat that I've missed uh, unless I've completely removed them. Um, no? All right. Well, let me do this for just two minutes. I'll let me steal two minutes of your time. And if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and end the call. Uh, but I wanted to show off some changes that we're making to decisions uh, and just kind of get you guys some early, early thinking on updates and ways that we're going to be uh, really ways that we're going to be rethinking some of the designer experience and decisions and how that impacts uh, your developers and your deployments specifically. So if you haven't seen this roadmap presentation, what this is, is this is uh, a presentation I give every two weeks. It's on Thursdays from 8, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern to noon Eastern. And this is a time where I walk through kind of some of the product strategy and dive in deep into what the slides that you're seeing here, an example of the slide that you're seeing here, which is our actual detailed roadmap of features and, and enhancements we're planning to make over the next uh, really 18 months. This goes out 18 months. And so I have this up on the screen. You can see, let me make it bigger, but you can see some of the ideas of things that we're working on here. But two of the things I really want to highlight is towards the end of this year and into the beginning of next year, we want to fundamentally rebuild or rethink the way that designers, specifically workflow developers, experience the portal and build out their projects. And so we've added this whole new concept of, of building a decision called the project view. And instead of having a massive folder tree on the left-hand side of decisions that our developers are expected to maintain and build and have all these crazy permissions around and understand, we instead want to reimagine that to actually being contained inside of a project. So as users go in and build their projects, all of the work that they care about, all of the, the testing and debugging and simulation that they care about is all going to exist inside of that singular project. And then the way that they, they add their data types and reference them, the way that they call subflows is all constrained to that experience of building inside, inside of your project. Then if you want to use things from other projects, that's really simple. You just create a dependency or a link between those two projects and allow the two resources to be shared. And so the big reason we're doing this is because with larger installations and especially some of our, our, our customers who've been around a while or who are building many, many projects, we see a lot of complexity and confusion around dependency uh, across you know, the organization around just kind of the web of confusion of the folder tree. And we really wanted to spend some effort and energy cleaning that up and making that simpler so that your building is simple and your deployment is simple. And so that's what we're really heavily focused on over the rest of this year and into next year, as well as a bunch of other just general updates. Some things you'll see here is we're streamlining and refactoring uh, some of these older features or, or features that haven't been really thought through or considered recently with current use cases. Uh, so we're going through and modernizing and updating quite a few of those and putting things into legacy, some things that are no longer used and kind of streamlining the entire product. So there's a lot going on here, some things that we're really, really excited about. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight this mainly as a little teaser, because if you want to see the full roadmap presentation, uh, I'm going to force you to come to that Thursday call because I talk about this in depth with a lot of what we'll be doing. Uh, but um, just an idea of some things that are coming down the road, some things you can expect is we're really, really trying to target um, the, the user experience. We're going to target the designer experience and make deployments really simple, really easy, which then in turn, Project View directly then turns into a new way to deploy and move your projects from one server to another. So we're rewriting the repository entirely with a different mindset, and we're going to be calling it the deployment server, and it's going to make your ability to move projects from one server to another just significantly simpler, uh, more repeatable, 
and with less confusion and error. So that's some big teasers for you. I did see a hand raise. Uh, so I went ahead and allowed you to unmute if you want to ask any questions or have anything you want to see here. Um, I do have a question. It's not specifically related to this roadmap because I think oh, we no might problem. actually be ahead of it. Well, it, it's kind of related. Um, we have one production product now, mm -hmm. project, if you will, and we're going to be adding a second one. And mm -hmm. it's kind of uses some of the same external data, but effectively it'll be, and some of the same users will use it, but it'll be kind of separated. We are way back on version 6.19 right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are planning in the first quarter of next year to skip version seven and go straight to version eight cool. so that we can kind of catch up. Do you recommend waiting until version eight to start that additional project? Um, because of some of these changes that you've got coming up, some of the things that you've already done. I know between six and seven, there's a lot of differences. So oh, would I recommend waiting? I, it, it depends. Like, and so that's a really, that's a really in-depth question. Uh, I would say that if there's work that you can get done now that is uh, really based around like core functionality, like workflow and rules and truth tables, like things that haven't changed, like truth tables have changed, but things that really haven't changed dramatically over the past two releases, like the workflow engine has gotten an architectural change, right? But the actual execution of it, the way you build and design hasn't changed a ton. So those sorts of works, you can absolutely start now and upgrading would have zero impact. Now, some UI pieces like simple forms or uh, I mentioned truth tables, some things that we have undergone some facelifts. Um, I would probably try to get on eight and work on those on the latest version because they have changed a little bit and give you some benefit uh, for being on eight as well. So I don't think I don't think there's any harm in starting now on version 619 and then upgrading. I just think you want to be really considerate of what pieces you're building and if they've changed in version eight and then trying to, to delay those pieces until you're upgraded. Now, some of the stuff around project view, since it is not going to be for another three or four months until we get this out in, in the wild, um, some of that is going to be interesting as well because there's going to be a conversion process, right? You're going to have people who have these massive folder trees or like yourself, you have one project already in, in prod and you're working on a second that aren't constrained to this project-based view that we're now designing. So there will be a wizard that you run through a conversion wizard that will take your projects and put them into these, these, these projects. Um, and that, that, that can occur anytime. I wouldn't wait for projects to be done to start it for that reason. The other reason I'd wait is if there's specifically version eight features you need that your project's gonna rely on. Right. Oh, and also, how do we attend that roadmap call? You keep mentioning oh, it, but how do we get on there if we want to? <laughs> Sorry, that's a great point. I probably should have mentioned that. Yeah, uh, you can contact your customer success manager or just email me, uh, just Eric, E-R-I-C at decisions.com and I'll get you added to that roadmap call. Uh, I don't, let me check my schedule. I don't think it's this Thursday. I just did one last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So next Thursday, uh, what is that? That'd be the uh, 22nd, I think, um, is the next one that we'll have. So if you want to get added to that, shoot me an email or ask your CSM and we'll make sure you're added. Thank you. Oh, you All right, one more question came in. It says, are you getting away from trunk philosophy to get? Uh, <laughs> we could go in great depth about the, the branching and merging and, and code-based philosophy of how we're doing it. Uh, if you want my, my honest answer, the honest answer is we're not sure. Uh, most likely, yes. Like uh, we're still we're still trying to really nail down as far as the deployment server goes, the methodology around how you you add stuff to your working copy and then branch and merge that back into the working copy and what that looks like, and how do we how do we balance traditional code development or kind of code development standards that people have adopted versus business user expectations and standards and common language, uh, and it's really hard. So uh, the true answer is, I can't answer, uh, but most likely, yes, we're kind of trying to lean away from some of the, the trunk uh, language and the way traditional code repositories work to try to gear more towards an IT ops deployment strategy rather than a, a code-based development strategy. 
Um, that's kind of the, the very high level explanation. If you're really interested in the deployment server, again, shoot me an email, eric at decisions.com. I have a, a really long, like 15 page technical document I'm working on that I'd love to get anyone's feedback uh, or, or, you know, kind of uh, ideas around. So uh, shoot me a note and I'm happy to set up a call there too. It's a good question. And apologies if anyone's heard the, 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 the little boy voice in the background. My, my uh, son is with me in the office today as my wife is a, a little ill. So uh, apologies if that's been distracting, but he's been pretty good. All right. Uh, I think we're, we're just about running up on time. Thank you all for attending and asking such great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't answer more of them. Uh, there's a few notes here I've taken that I will absolutely follow up on. If I don't get to you today, uh, please send me a reminder email, just eric at decisions.com. Otherwise, uh, look forward to meeting you on some more of these lunch and learns or another calls. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Please take care. So uh, have a good one. We'll talk soon.